Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nicole Smith. I'm Director of Library and Archives at the York County History Center. Um, if you have any questions during our webinar today, please put them in the chat feature and we'll be checking them and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. If you're on uh, Facebook, please, uh, we'll be checking comments as well there. Um, just let's see here. All right. I'd like to talk just a couple seconds about uh, some upcoming programs. On December 3rd, we have a webinar for Writers Roundtable. Uh, it'll be at seven o'clock and the speaker will be Samantha Dorm, uh, who will be discussing uh, the Lebanon Cemetery restoration. On December 12th, Saturday at 1030, we have our second Saturday lecture which is Ron Kirkwood uh, speaking about women during, at the Spangler Farm uh, during the Battle of Gettysburg. On December 19th at one o'clock, there will be a webinar on using uh, the York County History Center website for research. That webinar will be with myself and Dr. Adam Bentz. You can find out more information and register for any of these programs on our website yorkhistorycenter.org. Uh, I also would like to mention, and sadly, that the History Center has decided to close uh, the library and the museums uh, through the end of this year. Uh, but I really hope uh, in the new year um, we can be together again for more, more research. And I hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday. So right now, I'd like to introduce Rebecca Anstein. Uh, she will be giving the presentation today. Uh, she is a local genealogist, historian, and author, uh, library public services specialist for HACC, and she's also a member and corresponding secretary for uh, the South Central PA Genealogy Society. So Becky, I'm going to unshare my screen so you can share yours. and then you can take it away. Okay, let's see if I can do this. I'd like to welcome you and give a little bit of an explanation as to how this got started. And first off, I'd like to thank Pat Stanford for letting me use her family as the example. Pat and I had been together at breakfast several months ago and she was talking about trying to research her family tree using ancestry.com and newspapers.com, which are two subscription websites that you see advertisements for online. Both of these websites are also available at the York County History Center. And Pat said she was getting confused and lost and not quite sure what to do. So he said, well, give me some information and I'll see what I can do. And then I'll get back to you and we can meet at the History Center and use these two websites. Well, this is what she gave me. It's on the back of a restaurant placemat. She had death date for her grandfather, his first name, his middle name, and the name of his second wife. It's not really much to go on. At least some people would think that, but there's a lot there that I can work with. First thing I did was I went to newspapers.com to find an obituary. In newspapers.com, I picked browse because if I went to browse, I could narrow it down to just looking in Pennsylvania and a little bit further down to York. And you notice that there is a list of newspapers there. If I clicked more, I could narrow it down to a specific newspaper and a specific time. The first time I did this search with George W. Broadback, I had 287 matches. It's a little bit more than what I want to work with. And if you notice, 
Here on the left, you can enter a date range. And up in the corner, you can sort these by the oldest or the newest date. So I still wasn't happy with 287 people. So then I narrowed it down to 1968. And I came up with an obit, 10 matches this time, but the first one I can see mentions a George W. Broadbeck. So I'm going to narrow in on that. Now the 2000 or the 1,238 results up in that left corner were from a previous search that I had done that covered the entire state of Pennsylvania. So obviously you can get a lot of hits. But the one that I want is this one. And the first thing I notice is that there is a difference in the names. Instead of George W, it says George B. But there are about 12 different pieces of information in here on George that I can use to trace him. I can see how old he was, the name of his wife and her maiden name. It tells me he's born near Seven Valleys, who his parents were, and also the maiden name of his mother. In the obituary, I'm seeing who employed him and what he did. Gives me the names of two of his daughters and two sons. The only problem I have with the daughters is that it does not give their first names, just their husband's names. I, he also has a brother and a sister. So I'm going to take this information and put it into some charts. The first chart that I'm going to use is what's called a pedigree chart. It traces the generations. So I have George, I have his father's name, and I have his mother's name. The next chart I'm going to use is from, and I have to find right there. No. There we go. A family group sheet. And I'm going to fill in George about when he was born, where he was born, when he died where he's buried, the name of his parents, and under other wives, I'm going to put Dorothy. I have the names of the four children, but I've left the names of the sisters blank because I don't know their names yet. I'm also going to do a family group sheet for George's father and mother. So I have George, Jane, George, again, his brother Theodore, and his unknown sister, but her husband's name. Now I can go back to Ancestry.com and start my search. And I put in George B. Broadbeck. He lived in York County, and he was born in 1904. But I'm going to give myself some leeway here because I'm not sure yet exactly what his birth year was. The first thing you have to understand about looking for people by their name is that surnames can be spelled and pronounced in a variety of ways. There's no correct spelling. You can have alternate spellings that come from the education of person giving the information and receiving it. Accents play a part. How the name is pronounce, pronounced, if you think about, you can tell who lives in Pennsylvania and who doesn't live in Pennsylvania by the way they pronounce Lancaster. Or do they say Lancaster? Do they say Reading or Reading? So that all plays into how this name is going to be recorded. It also talks about were they writing the information down quickly? What was their handwriting like? What did they hear this person say? And who gave the information? A family member or a neighbor? And these are just a few of the different spellings that I noticed when I was looking for Pat's family. For my own last name, there are over 51 
different ways to spell it. The first time I put in this, for Georgia's results, I only got eight results. Down on the left corner, you can see birth, marriage, pictures, and a family tree. Up in the family tree, it gives a spouse's name of Velma A. It matches the birth date, the death date, and the parents' names. So I think I'm on a track, but I'm not happy. And I take out the B and do another search, and I get 36 results this time. This time, I have census records, birth, marriage, and death, and military. George's obituary said that he was living in Helm and that he had worked for the uh, chain company. So I want to look at this World War II draft card just to see what it says because it has Velma there and a birth date. Military records can provide information about pensions. One of the things that they've been putting online now are information about people who applied for compensation during World War II. And when you look at those records, sometimes you can get the names of parents, children, and spouses. But in this case, I'm just using the draft registration card. It tells me his middle name is Benjamin, tells me that he was born maybe in March 8th, 1904. But there's some variations on that birth date. And you can tell by looking at that crossed out month that it's hard to tell if it is the 8th or the 18th. Velma's listed. He works at an American chain company. And it also gives me a physical description. And this is nice because you can get an idea of what this person looked like. He's about five foot 10. He weighs 155 pounds. He has brown hair. And I don't think you can see it with me there. But off under complexion, it says ruddy, R-U-D-D-Y. So I'm not sure if that's ruddy or ruddy or what, but at least you know he has a complexion color. It also tells me that he has no physical characteristics such as scars, missing fingers or feet or anything like that, tattoos that would help identify him. Next thing I'm going to look for is to go back and look at this church records because I know looking at birth certificates isn't going to help me. They didn't start until 1906. George was born in 1904. And there's a curious record over here too for a George Broadbeck who was baptized in August of 1904 and was born in 1874. So that's a little bit suspicious looking to me. Well, this is the actual baptism registration book. It shows three children, Isaac William, Mamie Mary Jane, and George Benjamin Franklin. And these three children were born to George Franklin and Jane Broadbeck. So if you remember the obit, it said that George Benjamin Franklin was born in March and died in 1968. So we know that his parents from that obituary were Jane and George. And the interesting thing here too is that the same time George Franklin had three children baptized, he also got baptized and it gives his parents names. And just as a reminder, up until about the late 1800s, most of the ministers lived in the city of York and were circuit riders. So just because this record says that George was baptized at Salem Evangelical Lutheran in Jacobus, it doesn't mean that the family attended that church or were members of it. What the ministers would do would be to ride their circuit do the baptisms, marriages, ride on to the next church, do the same thing there. It can be said that 
they sometimes left the records at the church where they did it, or they took it back to their home church, or the ministers kept the records themselves. And when they moved on to even another city or another state, those records went with them. Next thing I want to look at is census records. George was living in Helm in 1942 during that draft record. So I want to start with that 1940 census record. You start with the newest census record and work your way back. The 1950 census has not been released yet. So the 1940 census is the newest one we have. Each census gives you a different piece of information about the person. This 1940 census shows us the ages, marital status, state of birth, and an interesting thing is whether or not they were living in that town or that house in 1935. If you're not finding them on the 1930 census and find them on the 1940 census, this is a good way to decide if they moved. It says George is a laborer in a chain works. Remember, he worked for American Chain Company. He worked 40 weeks that year. He made $800 for the entire year, and he completed four years of high school. What you're seeing on the screen is just a partial listing of that information. In 1920, he was living with his parents. And notice this time, his name isn't George Benjamin, it's George Franklin. He's 16 years old. He doesn't have an occupation. He's not attending school. He can read and write. And his parents are living on Centerville Road in Condoris Township. So a little bit different information. Plus, you see the name of Mamie Mary, who was baptized, George Franklin, Ralph Jonas, Theodore Sylvester, and Clara Viola. So now we have some brothers and sisters for George. You can see under the categories that birth, marriage, death are ones that you can look at. Now I want to look at some death certificates. When I go to the death and burial records, you'll see listings for find a grave, Pennsylvania death certificates, and an index for newspapers.com. And over here in the one corner, you can see it says 18, 19, 18th of March, 1904 is the birth date, but from the census or the uh, draft record, it said March 8th. So we need to figure out eventually which one is the right one. Remember I talked about handwriting being a factor. We're on a death certificate for George W. Broadbeck, which is George's father. And it says he's boarding born in Codding, York. If you look at the handwriting on that death certificate, it says Cadoris. So transcriptions aren't always informative. You have to put back or push back to the original source. You want the death certificates, the census records, the wills and baptisms. Transcriptions aren't always accurate and they can mislead you. So try to find the microfilm of the original document or the original document itself. This is George B's death certificate. Pennsylvania death certificates can be found through Ancestry, but also through the Pennsylvania State Archives. They made an agreement that if you lived in Pennsylvania, you could have access to the death certificates. It tells you where a person died, where they were living. You see the birth date, the death date. And if I blow it up, you can see it a little bit better that he's living in Helm. Oh, that's his wife. His wife, his second wife's name is there, his name of his mother and father. You can tell what the person died from the age, and in some cases, it will give you a social security number. 
And it also tells you that he worked for a chain company as a hardener, which was the same thing that was in his death certificate. I was able to find his first wife's name, Velma, and her death certificate. You can see what she died from, who her parents were, when she was born and when she died. And also on the death certificate, it tells you when they were buried and where they were buried. This is an example from Find a Grave. It's a website where they are going around and taking photographs of tombstones. They include as much information as possible. But when it says biography, that's not really a full biography. It just might be a copy of the obituary or information taken from the death certificate. But it does give his name, his father's name, his mother's name, the first wife. And this time it says Catherine Earhart and Wayne Allen Broadbeck. So now I have a possible first name for George's sister. I want to say something about those online family trees. You have to verify the information that's posted on those trees for yourself because those trees can be outdated and they don't always have the right information and people don't go back and correct if the information is wrong. Information may not be sourced. That means they're not telling you where they got that information for when they did that family tree. And you wanna make sure that all the dates match up. You don't want to see that the father died before the son was born. The other thing you want to make sure of is this the right individual? Sometimes people have taken a person who has the same first name, maybe the same birth date, death date years, and decided, oh, it's all the same, so it must be the one. And this can lead to a, a lot of confusion and some very strange family trees. This is just another family tree for George Franklin. It gives his wife's name, his father's name, and his mother's name. And only the name of one of his sons on this tree, it doesn't cover the rest. A closer look at that family tree shows George, mother and father, and we're back to an Isaac Broadbeck. Now on some of the census records, Isaac does not show up. He shows up in this baptism record. He's born in 1897, and there's Mamie and George and Ben Franklin, but I haven't been able to find him anywhere else. So the best place to look to find more information is in his mother's obituary. And I thought this was an interesting obituary because if you notice, she weighed 500 pounds when she died she had elephantitis, which means I'm going to go to Google and find out what that disease is. But underneath her survivors, it lists an Isaac W. Myers, in addition to George, BF, and Mrs. Mamie Klein, and Jonas Ralph. Now they've switched his first names. And a C. Sylvester, which is really Theodore. Jane also has two brothers, and they are living in this city, and a Clara Newland, who is a sister. So I have some more family members for Jane. After a lot of searching through a variety of different databases, websites, obituaries, I finally found a death certificate for Isaac William Myers shows his mother's maiden name is Janie Coons. His father was Isaac Myers. So that's another name that I have to look for more information on at some point in time. Newspapers can provide information that sometimes can't be found in other records and you don't want to overlook them. The social news can provide clues to relatives. It might say that John Jacob went to visit his aunt Sarah Smith. Generation pictures can help you identify some of your unnamed 
pictures and help you see what your ancestors looked like. Who's visiting who can show you the migration of families. If you have family members who moved to Ohio, but you're not sure if this is right, they might be listed in celebrations that have taken place. Business ads can identify a relative's occupation. And one of the ads or interesting things that I've stumbled across and had forgotten about was the children's newspapers. Remember when you used to get those birthday cards from the newspapers and your birthday was published in the newspaper? Well, birth certificates from the 1950s aren't available yet, but if you find a children's newspaper with birthday listings, it can give you the birth date. Items will also mention social clubs, churches, and awards that your relatives might have received. You might discover that your relative played the church organ or sang solos or was president of a social club. The historical events from that time can show you what life was like. It gives you an inside perspective of what was happening. And I always like to look at the grocery ads to see how much food was being charged for. Certain events can lead to other sources in the newspaper. If you can't find a death date for someone, you might be able to find an announcement in the paper that says letters of administration were assigned, which could take you to wills or orphans court. An orphans court isn't for orphans. It's for people who died without a will. You can find guardianships there, property divisions, petitions. So don't discount using the orphans court. Deeds will give you information. If property had to be sold, it will tell you who the heirs were, where they were living, the names of their spouses. So you can find all kinds of information in a newspaper. Just some examples. The five generations, we have Mamie here in the center, her father, George, her daughter, her daughter, and grandson. And it shows you all those people and now you have an idea of what they looked like. This one over here is a list for an auction for Granville Messersmith. He was the grandfather of Leah Messersmith, but I have not been able to find any information on him except for that auction announcement. You remember Belma Broadbeck had a grandparent named Werner. So this tells me when her death was. Jane Coons, remember her name? Her father was Henry and he was a paper hanger. But you'll see in the right hand side, a recommendation. So long before we had Home Advisor, people would take out ads in the newspaper and recommend the work of someone like Henry, a good way to do business. You're going to reach the end of what you can find on the internet. So you try and figure out where do you want to go next and what blanks do you want to fill in? New York History Center Library is a good place to go. Unfortunately, we won't be able to use it for the next couple of weeks. But what you see here are family files and the inside of a family file. Behind me are maps, which are good because you can locate some of those odd towns like Coddington. The History Center has vital cards with births, deaths, and marriages. And I check them because as we saw before, death certificates and birth certificates weren't kept by the state until 1906. So newspaper announcements and church records are the only way you might be able to find that. You can find abstracts from estate records. Family files have letters of inquiry, obituaries, documents, family trees. The other thing that the History Center Library has are city directories. If you can't find someone in a census, you can check the city directories. Family genealogies, local history books. Another good collection for looking for photographs are the high school yearbooks. They have a large collection for a lot of the schools within the county. 
So you can check there to see if you might find an early photograph. They also have a photograph collection and manuscript. The computer access at the History Center Library also has a variety of databases in addition to Ancestry.com and Newspapers.com. And if you want to learn more about Newspapers.com, Dr. Adam Bentz did a presentation specifically on using Newspapers.com that can be found on the YouTube page. The Orr County Archives is also another place to go. It holds original documents and records from 1749. If you look online, you can find indexes for deeds, estate files, and marriage licenses. And then you can go out to the archives and look at the actual microfilms of those documents or the original ones in the estate files. There are also some indexes that the staff can check that have not been put online yet. Marriage licenses give you a lot of information, unlike some of the states, such as Maryland, which only takes the name of the bride and the groom. But in Pennsylvania, you can get parents' names, occupations, and birthplaces. Remember when we started, I had just this month's information in a pedigree chart. If we look at that pedigree chart now, you can see I've filled in quite a bit of information and gone back five generations on the Broadbeck family. And poor Pat, luckily she and I are not related, but there is an Anstein, and you know they say everybody in York County is related. The other thing I can go back now and do is expand on my family group sheets. This is what we started with for George. And this is what I have now for George. You can see complete birth dates, christening dates, burial dates, marriage date for when he married Velma, census records I've put in, the uh, draft card, his complexion, where I found his obituary. Again, for Velma, I've done the same thing. And I've even been able to fill in the names of the children and some of their information. One of the other things that I use is a descendant chart. And I started with Samuel and went down. So you can see Samuel, second generation, George W. Broadbeck, third generation, George Franklin Broadbeck, fourth generation is George Benjamin Franklin Broadbeck, fifth generation, George William Broadbeck, and then down to Pat, the sixth generation. So we've gone from just information on one person and now have six generations of her family history that she can look at and go back to and do more research on. Oops. All of the charts that I use can be found online. You can use Google and just put in free downloadable genealogy charts and you'll come up with a large variety of charts that you can pick and print out ones that would suit you that have the information you want to put in or the information you don't want. One of the most interesting ones I found was this PDF filler because you could fill it out as you went online. Whoops, it's gonna go back to that and I don't want that. Sorry.
You never know what's going to happen when you push a button sometimes. You're doing great, Becky. I'll get there. <laughs> First time I've done a webinar, so I'm really trying to figure out where I am and what I'm doing. There we go. Just as a wrap up, I love to look for genealogy cartoons. And these are ones that kind of made fun of family trees. Some family records can make you get some strange images. If you look at this first one, he was baptized before he was born. An interesting concept. The next one, a lot of people want to look for the royalty in their family. Well, in my case, I probably would have to be content with the cousin who knew Benjamin Franklin's cook. And the other thing is when you go and do that, ah, I lost it. Where'd it go? I lost my uh, last one there that talked about the uh, person who I'll share. We'll get back there. The person who had merged in the wrong life and he's being haunted by I don't know why haunted by his uh, great grandfather because they've merged uh too many people. Oh, the joys of doing a PowerPoint. <laughs> is that your is that the end there, Beth? Yep, that's the end. I should okay. go on my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if you just want to hit uh, stop share on your screen. Okay. And then, you know, thank you so much. I mean, <laughs> Some really great information in that presentation. You can tell I'm pretty nervous about doing this. Well, you did great. And up until that last one, you were, it was all smooth. <laughs> okay. Um, everyone, if you have any questions for Becky, please, uh, there's a little time if you want to ask them in the chat or on Facebook. Uh, we do have one question that came in. And it's from, I use, I'm sorry, okay. I, was gonna say, I can answer it. Well, Should why don't I read it to you and then you can answer it. Um, okay. Tell people what you think. Um, Lynn asks, uh, what do you think of familysearch.com is her first question. And her second question is, if I had to just subscribe to one website, what would you recommend or not recommend? Mm. Should I just click on answer live? No, just tell us. Okay. I use family search a lot because it is a free website and it does have a lot of information, but I do find it hard to use sometimes because it's not easy to narrow down on the information that I'm looking for as much as I would like to narrow it down. But I do go back because you can find information on family search from all the materials that they microfilmed. So it covers a lot of things that are not other websites. I go there a lot for probate records because I can't always find them in Ancestry or through a state website. So a lot of the early probate records are there, especially for Maryland. I've used it a lot for Maryland probate records, but I also use it for Pennsylvania probate records. So I like family search. Yeah. Yeah, and it's free. Um, it's free. And you can <laughs> find a lot there. It's enough to keep you busy for a lifetime. If I had to recommend I don't know because I subscribe to newspapers.com. 
I have ancestry. I also su subscribe to one called Genealogy Bank, which has a lot of newer obituaries, um, more specific social security records. And it does cover some of the newspapers that aren't on newspapers.com. So I can't, I'm not really good at recommending or not recommending a lot of it's a personal preference. Yeah, I was thinking maybe um, Ancestry for beginners. Um, yeah, to get started. Um, here, I'll, I'll I, next one for you. Um, next okay, one. I was going to jump down to Shelly's question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go because ahead. As long as we're talking about newspapers.com, yes, it is available for at the History Center for you to come in and use. But mm -hmm. the library edition, so it's just what, limited to Pennsylvania newspapers? Yes, yes, and it isn't quite as extensive as uh, a personal subscription would be. But yeah, anyone can access what we do have, uh, the library edition of newspapers.com when they when you come to the History Center. Um, let me read Rebecca's question, uh, since folks watching can't actually see the questions. Okay. Uh, uh, Rebecca asks, can you post the websites of additional info that you listed on the next slide? Yes, I can, um, I can do that. I can, uh, we can make those available on the website. Um, then we have a question from Susan who says, I no longer live in York County, have a pretty good family tree, like to fill in more details. Any suggestions? Wish I could visit. Hmm. I don't, did I lose me? Can you see me? I can see you. Okay, I can't I see can me. see you. <laughs> okay. It depends on what kind of information you want to add to your family tree. If you haven't used the newspapers, that would be a good place. If you don't have deeds, the archives would be good to find the deeds. Yeah. Um, and there's deeds on family search now, right? Uh, Lynn would know more about that than I would because she has that we want her to do that good guide she has on family, families. <laughs> right. <laughs> Did you hear that, Lynn? We're going to put you in a web <laughs> webinar. Uh, Becky, maybe you could bring up the slide. Um, can you bring up your slideshow again for uh, uh, additional resources, the next to the uh, slide? Yeah, let me go into that. On the current slide. Um, oh, I reached the end. Share your so, screen. That's where, where is that? I'm not seeing share my screen. Mm. Okay. Well, maybe we've unhooked you for some reason, but you are still live. So we're, we're still with you. Okay. There, I think that's the slide she's talking about, but. Yeah. If, um, if you can't, I can post it on Facebook or uh, put it on our website. Yeah, I don't see where I don't see that share my screen thing now. Mm -hmm. um, Susan, if you want to give us a call at the History Center, we could um, maybe help you in your genealogy. We do have we are going to be continuing to work through the end of the year, the staff and uh, we we might see what we have here that could help you. We also we also offer a research by mail service here at the History Center. Um, Susan says she also has an Anstein in her York family. <laughs> oh, I've done a lot of research on the Anstein. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rebecca has another question. She's asking what websites are good for international genealogy research? Ancestry has some international genealogy research. I would go to Family Search because they have microfilmed a lot of the church records 
from overseas and you can search them online. Again, that's a free website too. If you check genealogy magazines, such as your family tree, and I forget what the other one is, they have evaluated different websites for different countries. Cindy's list would be a good one to go and check for um, a listing of overseas international genealogy because there are a lot of archives that have put their information on say online. Yeah. Cindy's I list. I was gonna say maybe you could, Richard Kunkel does a lot of online research and he might know some really good ones. So he would be a good one maybe to try and get information from. Mm -hmm. Get him to do a list of websites. Yes, yes, that's true. Um, we have a list of websites here at the History Center. Um, I should, I'll see what I can put on our website. Uh, it's yorkhistorycenter.org. Uh, Lynn says, thanks. Uh, this, this is not Lynn from uh, our volunteer Lynn. This is a different Lynn. Oh, this is a different Lynn. Okay. She says, it's a big help. Thank you. Uh, the presentation was great. Uh, Rebecca asks, um, are there pedigree charts, group sheets available for purchase? Um, you had said everything you used was downloadable and free online. Yeah, and you can, well, I know you had some uh, pedigree charts at one time in the bookstore. Yeah, some of the art, fancier artistic kind. Yeah, if you look online, you can find a lot of different ones. Pin interest might have examples of different ones that could be purchased. Um, Becky, do you know Cindy's list? Do you know what that website actually is? Or is that like I Cindy's list? I think if you list. just do Cindy's list.com or just type in Cindy's list. In is that with a Y or a? It's a Y. Yeah. Y and so. D maybe. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll get that on the website too. Uh, let me see, we do have some other questions here. Um, okay, Sam, Sam has a question. Uh, she has info on an individual that indicates they died in 1980, but the social security records of payment appear to be 1988. She's wondering why that would be. Either it got transcribed wrong. Mm -hmm. I would check. Is that Samantha Dorm? Yes. Samantha, email me and I'll check. <laughs> <laughs> Becky will look into it for you. But yeah, it sounds like it could be, oh, the year could have been transcribed wrong or reversed when they did it or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we might want to look for an obituary too. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Julie who says, how do you look for information about the social news? And that would be on when you're on newspapers.com. I just type in a name and see what pops up. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing, I think there's a choice you have on there. They keep changing that website now that you can click all. And it'll bring up anything and everything. Or possibly with their new search, you might be, I don't know. I haven't tried putting in the name and like birthdays and the location. Mm -hmm. Playing around with the new version that they have. Yeah. Yeah, um, and it's wonderful that we have the newspapers digitized now, and you can just put in a name and it will bring up all the references to that name. Um, whereas in the past with microfilm, that would have been trickier to find those things. Oh, yeah. I found so much more through the digitized newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. 
Oh, Sam Dorm asks, do you help people track their families for free or is there a fee? <laughs> are you are you for hire, Becky? <laughs> Mostly I've been doing it for free. Yeah. Yeah. We we do um do offer some research service here at the History Center, but there is a fee for that. And um, South Central. And South Central. Also, we'll do it for a fee. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can always give uh, us a call and we can see how we can help. Um, what are good resources for people earlier than what is in newspapers.com? Well, earlier, uh, those newspapers.com can go, go all bad. the way back to 1732. Yeah, at least at least yes. the early 1800s. Um, yeah, I've seen back in the 1700s, mm -hmm. Revolutionary War and yeah. prior to that. It depends on whether or not they have had access to digitize those papers. Mm -hmm. Well, and then we often recommend um, coming in because we have a lot of church records and things that would go back earlier than the newspapers uh, per se um, here at the History Center or at the county archives. Okay. Uh, Rebecca, I can see the uh, chat list and Shelley wants to know if anybody has Clores, Gladfelders, Shelleys, or Stettlers on their tree. If you do message uh, Shelley. And it's uh, Rebecca wants, it's Cindy's list, the second one on your thing, the name of the female. Okay. And I'm going to tell Jenny from Friends of Lebanon, hi. <laughs> we haven't been digging lately. <laughs> We've yes. Been emailing. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. If there, um, if there are any more questions, please uh, type them now. Oh, I see. Shelly Riddell has no. Shelly, you and I have crossed paths in Dallas Town principal there when my kids went to school. I didn't go to Echo Trail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sam says they have a challenge for you. Oh, is she going to tell me? She hopes you're ready. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, on that note, I think we'll sign off. <laughs> But uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, please keep an eye on the History Center website and email blasts for all of our upcoming virtual programming. If you have any suggestions of other topics you'd like to see explored or explanations, let uh, Nicole know. Yes, yes, please do. Please do. And thank you again. Bye bye.